Hello, and welcome to another episode of Climbing on the Bookshelf. This episode, I have a great chat with action sports presenter of the Red Bull X Alps, the UIAA Ice Climbing World Cup, and all round nice guy and adventure man, Tarquin Cooper. We talk about his introduction into the outdoor world and the role he has in commentating and other stuff. We also talk a bit about mountaineering books. Hope you enjoy this one. So I'd like to welcome Tarquin Cooper. Thanks, Stuart. It's great to be on the show. Okay, thank you. If you could um, tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got into the kind of outdoor world. Sure. I mean, I've been involved with mountain sports, um, not just climbing now for Ooh, around 20 years, um, which makes okay. me feel really old. Um, <laughs> but my, I'm a journalist by trade. And um, okay. I, I sort of trained as a journalist after I left university. And then I was fortunate enough to get a, a traineeship with The Telegraph. And okay. um, at the end of that, I heard about this, this expedition going down through South America, uh, led by this extraordinary named character called Colonel John Blashford Snell. And I joined that expedition and um, wrote about it for the paper's travel section. Um, and it was a three month trip. And afterwards I thought, hey, wow, this is this is a, a great way to uh, earn a living like this job. Uh, not realizing that that was yeah. literally a once in a kind of decade experience. But um, undeterred, I, I sort of stayed on with the paper and, and I wrote for their um, one of the, the weekend supplements about um, outdoor and adventure sports um, and notably climbing. Yeah. And um, I continue to write for them at the moment. Although uh, these days it's, it's limited to the obituaries page. So uh, that could probably be a, a podcast all by itself. But I tend to write, um, you know, mountaineers and climbers um, or daredevils, as the, uh, the, the Telegraph calls them. Um, but it's, it's quite a, a unique honor uh, to try and capture a life uh, in, you know, 800 words. Yeah, so, so uh, that's one of my jobs. Um, and then, yeah, as you say, I, I don't just write about things. I, I talk about them as well. Um, and and uh, more recently, I got involved with the, um, the UIAA Ice Climbing World Cup, which is a lot of fun. No, two, so two years ago, I, um, yeah, we covered, went to, to China. In fact, it was quite funny. It was, um, uh, I was in uh, China, South Korea, literally just before COVID broke Good out. Grief. Okay. And then, and then, and then in the Alps, um, and then in Russia, Russia in early March, and then uh, also I'm involved with um, an event called the Red Bull X Alps, which is the world's toughest adventure race. It's it's an amazing adventure uh, adve- ad- adventure race across the Alps, from um, you know basically Salzburg uh, this year to to Mont Blanc and back, and and athletes have to hike or fly. It's it's a sort of ultra running mixed with paragliding and some kind of madcap adventures in between. And it's, it's, it's um, an amazing race. I've been involved with it for about 10 years. The athletes are many of them, you know, really extraordinary, you know, individuals um, yeah. who've got, you know, many of them are, are you know, climbers, to- you know, very good accomplished alpinists, also ultra runners um, and the world's best paraglider pilots. And sure, what yeah. they do is just insane. <laughs> It's not uncommon for an athlete to hike, you know, three or four thousand meters of vertical in a day and 50, 50 plus kilometers. Um, I mean, in the last few days of the race, and this is a race that goes on for two weeks, uh, there was a French yeah. athlete who uh, literally just hiked 160 odd kilometers in the last 40 hours, you know, coming on top of, you know, 12 days. And, and you know, it's not just that they're great endurance athletes, but when you're flying, you know, they're flying often in incredibly challenging um, turbulent conditions where it, it's kind of life and death decisions going on all the time. Yeah. And they're, they're basically flying when, when no normal person would fly in very, very rough uh, air. And, and um, you know, that's, that's quite an extraordinary thing to do. Um, you would not thought about doing it yourself. <laughs> no you, chance. you just chase no them chance. down and try and catch them. You wouldn't. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, you, you, you know, be like learning to drive and then, and then going off and racing F1. You know, you wouldn't get I wouldn't get around the first corner without killing myself. But, you know, my job is basically as a reporter, I'm, I'm running around trying to trying to chase the athletes. It's a, it's a bit like a playing a sort of Pokemon. You know, you kind of got various yeah. navigation apps. You've got the live tracking. Yeah. You know, you've got Google Maps. You've got a, you know, you know, a topo map. And you're trying to you've got, you know, a little flashing dot of where the athlete is. And there's a little bit of delay in the system. And you're trying to sometimes literally running around the streets trying to trying to work out where they'll be because they're a little bit like a few minutes ahead 
yeah. um, or, or in the woods or the hills. Um, and even when you're hiking up in the morning, so I'd, I'd find, usually I'd find an athlete last thing at night, 11 o'clock at night, um, yeah. and then would be up at, on the go, hiking by five o'clock in the morning. And even, you know, after a week on the go, they're still going incredibly fast and, you know, hike up quick thousand meters of vertical up the mountain yeah and then and then watch them watch them launch and uh yeah so and then i'd race back down to the car jump in the car and quite often they would beat me to the next kind of turn point uh because they're flying as the crow flies yeah. where i'm sort of yeah. driving around crazy roads switchbacks and, and all the rest so so have you got a crew with you or is it just just you or no it's just me and uh, my wife actually um she's okay. my support so she helps with the driving so while she's driving i can be scribbling away um <laughs> you know writing stories for the website or trying sure. to interview t calling up athletes it's um yeah it's a fun it's a fun event i see that on kind of social media that you even in your sort of time off you're still out and about and on the water and all that sort of stuff um so it sounds a bit stalkerish now how's the sailing going <laughs> um yeah <laughs> I saw so, that. So, I thought it was brilliant so so I, i'm not much of a sailor uh, uh, I, I heard from a name i, th I think I, I live near the water so i just thought it's it's um uh it's really rude not to sail or do something on the water i've got a stand-up paddleboard but let's be honest it's a bit of a crap sport and i'm okay. sure there are lots of dedicated um you know uh, paddlers out there um yeah, but it's a bit hardcore. rubbish yeah um it, it's a bit rubbish you can't and you can't go in and kind of um when it's windy um you know it's like having a sail up the i thought well the best thing is actually to get a proper sail and and actually teach myself to sail so i bought a boat for 200 quid and promptly capsized <laughs> okay <laughs> so uh yeah I, i've taken i've decided uh um um that there might be a good idea to get myself a sailing lesson good sounds like a lot of fun um yeah but no i still i still keep active so you know yeah. I, do, I do still climb myself you know being in austria um obviously some 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 great limestone there uh and the northern yeah. alps um i did a did a great route which has been on my tick list for for ages yeah which is on the um the south face of the dachstein mountain um yeah. and you know it was sort of 15 pitches and um yeah it was quite a long day but it was it was just absolutely magical where you're you know you're kind of reaching up and, and you know it's very it was very very steep but there, you know there was holes everywhere you know your hand okay. just magically fell on a great jug or you know, yeah so which added to the excitement um requiring an abseil uh across to get into the the, the next sort of uh, uh chimney um but okay. yeah no it's 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 fun i, I mean climbing is is where it all began for me and i feel like that's where i came of age if you like as a for outdoor sport i did um, i joined an alpine club um uh meet uh, a couple of years ago um, yeah. the year before covid and alpine club is 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 um yeah it's great actually you know if you're not if you're short of climbing partners and and um you know it's a great way to meet climbers and and um you know they're, they're good fun when you go on a, a climbing trip you know with yep. several other climbers and we did a we we went to the um uh, lauterbrunnen yep. um and, and kandersteg in switzerland and we did a we did a, a ridge that was a really exposed ridge um quite near the Mitteleggi ridge quite near the eiger but okay. um, yeah uh, it was on the the bright horn the lauterbrunnen bright horn um which was quite exciting because on the way down um i heard this really strange kind of humming buzzing noise and i was thinking what is that weird yeah. sort of it was like a vibration going on and it's yeah. like in my camelback in the tube it was sort of making this weird gurgling noise and yes. i suddenly realized it was the electrical charge it was in gonna the air. be and so yes. suddenly you know we're on exposed bridge <laughs> thinking we're gonna where you are you know, gonna go <laughs> yeah uh, lightning coming coming down when you've got a yeah steel ice axe aluminium ice yeah. axe whatever uh not a lot of fun but in the immortal phrase, yes, yeah, it was it was a memorable experience. So all the travel and things that you do um, throughout the world, are there any mountaineering or climbing books that you take with you that you're kind of reading currently and things? And um, no, just the memories. Um, I think the, the you know, I'm a real kind of one book. Uh, one, you know, one, one read is enough. There's so many books out there. I, yeah. I, I'm not one of these yeah. people who just goes back and rereads. Um, the same book unless it's for i don't know research purposes yeah sure but you know they, they they the good climbing books do have stayed with me i mean i remember i mean things that i when i first started getting into climbing i had a real um 
uh, urge to just just throw myself in and and just read up on all these these climbing greats and 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 books. And I do still remember many of them. You know, of course, you know, Joe Simpson's touching the void, and also yes. um, you know this game of ghosts, which I remember actually had a bigger effect on me. It was actually just... I prefer that one. Yeah, it just captures the kind of the yeah. lifestyle, the vagabonds, the camaraderie, you know, just the the kind of living on the edge, um, that spirit, um, you know, dirtbag climbers. You know, yeah. it, I think for me that had that book had massive appeal. I remember reading some of the, you know, the Bonington books um, and just being massively inspired. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the, the climbing library is, is, you know, there's no shortage of of, of books out there. There's not too many, but it's almost too many to read if you just keep keep on. Oh yeah, you get keep easily my... get. Yes, it, it's 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 easy to get intimidated. Well, I'm I'm kind of in themes at the moment, so I've had I've just done a, a kind of spell of of Himalayan books. Yeah, I've just finished reading Ed Caesar's The Moth and the Mountain. Okay, that's, that's um, a great book so far. I mean, I'm kind of I'm about fifty or sixty pages in. Oh, well, I don't want uh, to ruin it for you. No, no, it's not a problem at all. No, you, you go for it. I'm pretty sure I know what happens anyway. So, um, but that that takes a, a singular uh, look at one climbing episode. You know, it follows one individual's attempt yeah. to climb Mount Everest in the 1930s. But um, before that, I read um, uh, oh, what's it called, Scott? Uh, let me dig it out. I just had it here to my hands. Let's dig <laughs> it out. Oh, yeah, that's it. The, the World Beneath Their Feet um, by Scott okay. Ellsworth. Yep. And that is uh, looks at Himalayan climbing in the in the 30s, the British, the Nazis and the Americans and yep. their sort of quest to climb the basically that the, the highest mountains. And then um, there's another book that's that's a great book in a way. Ed, Ed's um, uh, book builds on this. It's it's um, this great, great sort of tome from from Wade Davis called Into the Silence, which looks at okay. the, the British expeditions of uh, the 1920s. So going back almost 100 years now, his argument is that that experience informs their um, the decisions that they make on Everest and they and ultimately basically infor- informs their, you know, their characters. And um, and, and the, yeah. the, the interesting thing on that is that he, he takes a kind of a real overview on what Ed Caesar's done. And Ed Caesar is not a is not a climber. He's an outsider, which in some ways I wonder whether is. An advantage when you're looking at you know mountaineering stories because he suddenly he's read about this character called Morris Wilson in a footnote or just as a paragraph in one of these kind of Himalayan books I think actually it was in a Messner he's he, he's been somewhat poo-pooed by the kind of uh, um, you know climbing in, in climbing literatures perceived if you like as a, as a bit of a crank an oddball um, <laughs> he he set off to climb the mountain with no experience whatsoever um and and promptly died died during the attempt so you know he he's not he's seen as a a bit of an outsider he was never you know within the sort of mountaineering circles so i suppose the in 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 the kind of the mountaineering circles they've never really treated him as one of as one of their own um he's seen as an outsider and it's taken at this this sort of remark from reinhold messner to 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 kind of view him as, as very much a kindred spirit and um, so anyway, the result is, is Ed sees is a great writer, but what he's done is, is, is an incredible amount of research, piecing together everything that he can about this man's life from, yeah. um, you know, the letters, the, the ship dockets to his, you know, his ex-wives and, and yeah. has pieced together the story of a man who served in the First World War who was incredibly damaged by that experience, like many of his contemporaries, you know, shell shock, PTSD, et cetera. Um, you know, he, he's kind of footloose and, and struggling to, to reintegrate into society. And, um, you know, he, he travels around and, and eventually settles upon, I know what I need to do. I need to climb Mount Everest. And I'm sure there are many climbers and adventurers who are attracted to climbing because of its singular focus. You know, many um, climbers talk about, you know, it's I mean, I remember re- uh, reading, you know, Chris Bonington talk about how, you know, climbing a mountain is the easy part. You know, it's 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 the day to day life that's challenging, you know, paying your tax return, etc. You know, so so, you know, I guess like like many adventurers, he was just attracted by that singular focus. Um, he decided that, of course, he was going to be a bit make it a bit more interesting. Um, he was going to fly there in a biplane. 
Um, so, you know, undeterred by the fact that he had no flying experience at all, he learned and he was qualified after 19 hours, which is absolutely nothing. I mean, I'm, I'm learning to paraglide at the moment. And, and uh, okay. you know, if you have 19 hours as a paraglider pilot, you're still, you know, low airtime pilot. And, and, and this guy with 19 hours, 20 odd hours, he, he thinks nothing of setting off an, uh, on a, you know, really the kind of heroic flight. On a perilous journey. Yeah. Um, you know, in the, in the mould of, of, you know, Santac Subri um, yeah. uh, across to, to India. And what makes it even more exciting is he, he's kind of chased down by, by the sort of British bureaucracy. Um, who are trying to impound his plane because he doesn't have the permissions. They don't want him sort of creating a fuss, you know. Um, you know, they don't want him to upset the Tibetans or the Nepalese because that could jeopardize getting um, future permits. Um, and and he sort of runs rings around them. And you kind of fall <laughs> in love with this guy and just think he's a great, uh, a great character. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading, to the re- reading the rest of it. But what I've read so far... Um, I'm kind of warming to him already, and he's he's been divorced once, and he's just married again. Um, and his time in on, on the on the front is that I thought I've found that really fascinating because, well, my my own experience of that is my granddad was born in 1923, he's still alive now. He's 98, nearly 99, and the fact that I know somebody firsthand that has fought in a war just kind of when I start reading about that, there's just something about it thinking that's just, it's just an incredible thing mm. to have, to have gone through that. And yet he still wants to go off on adventures and, and fly a plane and, and climb Everest is, is unbelievable when yeah. some of his kind of uh, people around him are, are, have got severe PTSD and, and he's just getting on with it. Well, this, so so I mean, yeah, this this Ed Caesar book, you, you should read it in conjunction with um, Into the Silence, which takes a, you know, the kind of the big overview and looks at, you know, a lot of the, you know, all the British characters um, yeah. and how the war affected them. Um, and, you know, he I think he has a theory that, that they were kind of inured to death, um, that they, they didn't mind it. It was sort of welcomed as a friend. I'm not sure everyone yeah. buys that argument, but um I mean, it's been a while since I read it, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, I think at, at any rate, it had a profound experience on them. And I mean, certainly I, I'm i fascinated at that. I've been going through a period of, of um, interest on the uh, German climbers of the 1930s and those guys okay. who, who came of age after the First World War. And certainly, you know, it bred some incredibly tough climbers. Um, you know, when you think about yeah. the the north face of the Eiger, the first ascent in 1938, yeah. um, which was led by Andel Heckmer, um, he grew up in an orphanage. He was so hungry. He was stealing food off the pigs, you know, and, and it's just, you know, you can't imagine. You just can't imagine that today. And I think that experience yeah. was was not in, not uncommon. Herman Bull, you know, the great Herman Bull, he grew yeah. up. His mother died, I think, when he was four. He grew up in an orphanage as well. Um, and I think, um, I would love to be able to, my language skills are not great. I'm just about possible in French, but German, okay. forget it. I would love to be able to read some of the, the, the climbing books, yeah. uh, German those, climbing books. And those sort of names, um, appear in so many of the books and they all knew each other of that sort of, you know, thirties and forties climbers in Europe. They all got together and went on expeditions to the, to the larger rangers in, you know, there's, um, the book. Conquistadors of the Useless by Lionel Terry. He just, you know, he's an unbelievable climber. The amount of things that he's done, and uh, he did something with Herman Bull as well, which is, I think, where I think he was walking behind him, and I think that's where he died. Herman Bull, I think he dropped somewhere. Yes, I'm yes. trying to think uh, where it um, was. Yeah, he um, fell. it was. It was um, I think it was. It was after Nanga Parbat. Um, I forget the name of the mountain, yeah. but yeah, he yeah. he just walked off a cornice. That's right. The mist came yeah. down and, and he just came off, uh, which is yeah. sadly not uncommon. Um, no, but but yeah, it's, it's, it's funny how, how everybody knew each other. Yeah, it's a very, I think, a, 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 you know, a small world. I mean, and, that might, and, be the same, might be the same today. I don't know. But just because it's in literature, it means that obviously... Um, well, I think the, the bonds that forged climbers back in the day were a lot stronger than, than yeah. they are 
you know, than today. they are today. I yeah. mean, the, the club scene in, in, you know, today is not quite as strong because you don't need to join a club. You can find people on, you know, Facebook or social media. Yeah. And, and, you know, staying in touch with people is just so much easier. Whereas I think back in the day, you were really, your only chance was to be with a club and, you know, you, you know, you, you go with the same, um, you know, and to be with those and also traveling, you know, you've got to remember in the thirties, <laughs> the Munich climbers. So they, they're bicycling everywhere. Um, yeah. You know, you can't just jump in the car or, or fly to, um, you know, Spain for a bit of uh, rock climbing. You're basically <laughs> loading everything on your bike um and that almost that makes the, the whole experience then, that much more heroic as well and they wouldn't be short journeys either on a bike no <laughs> um <laughs> they'd be sort of 60 70 mile there and then do a climb 60 70 mile back exactly and a and a kind of you know a bike probably weighing 15 kilos with <laughs> without even uh you know equipment loaded up yes made of steel yeah um i think there's a there's a scene in, i remember in walter bonatti's on the heights which is a great book another you know amazing classic and, and very influential that was one of the early ones i read as well okay um and i think there's a scene there where he's he's cycling across the alps and he bumps into another climber and um it's been a while since i read it but i just remember that, that they share some food one guy had some bread and another guy had some oranges and they sort of you know <laughs> shared the food amongst themselves and then carried on i think this this incredibly strong kindred um, spirit that united climbers. I'm not sure that's that's so strong today. Maybe back then because it was it was so dangerous. Um, yeah. You know the attrition rate was so high. So Himalaya stuff. I think yeah, the, yeah. the moth on the mountain. That's a, that's a great one. But that's I also wanted one. to mention um, uh, um, uh, Scott Ellsworth's "The World Beneath Their Feet" because okay. that that gives a, a a really it only came out i think last year the year before last so quite a recent book and he's a sports uh, writer um so he's not a climber um per se yeah and um he's written a ve- it's a very entertaining book looking at um particularly the kind of you know the the, the brits the germans and the americans in in the himalayas in the 1930s and in particular on um you know nanga parbat which was for the Germans, you know, like Everest was for the British. It was considered like a, a German, um, you know, German mountain. Uh, it was known as the murder mountain uh, for its high attrition rate. I mean, throughout the 30s, the, the Germans, um, they led a, you know, there was had a slew of expeditions. And, you know, one year, 16 yeah. climbers died in an avalanche. Um, you know, I think... You know, half and half, half were Sherpas, the other half were, you know, come out from Europe. Yeah, every time they got their asses spanked, basically. <laughs> and and it was it was in 39 that that the their the, the last it was um uh Heinrich Harrer who who who'd been on the the Eiger in 38 with with Hegmer. Yep. That Hegmeier, was when he yeah. was there with with Peter Auschneider. Yeah, they 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 were doing a recce, and it was there that they after after that the war broke out and he got uh, arrested by Indian uh by the british and um and he spent seven years in tibet yeah i mean it, it it's just an incredible story that, that that goes all the way from you know from the 30s up to to herman bull in in 1954 i think um when yeah. he made the first ascent um but then you know the legend continues with nanga parbat you know when you get to the the, the, the messner years and he had that epic um where he lost his brother um and yeah. then was 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 he was sued for libel by the um expedition leader um he was accused of abandoning his brother and that then rolled on for another kind of 20 years of of sort of claim and counterclaim as he sort of fell out with the expedition members and and eventually i think about a decade ago um his brother's re- remains of his brother were found on the mountain you know if you like your kind of epic tales nanga parbat then that's the one yeah with your sort of traveling the things that you all do with your um adventure sports and commentating and things where's the favorite place where's your favorite place in the world oh in my world well uh that's a tough tough one i could tell you my my favorite climbing place okay i love the 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 y valley you know you're not going to go there because it's you've got the best routes but it's where i learned to climb okay and i just have such incredible happy you know memories there yeah. And yeah. I think it's partly because when you when you learn a new sport, well, funnily enough, I actually uh, I was there uh, a week ago oh, um, and, I, and I paddled all the way from Rye to uh, Ross on Wye to, okay. to uh, Monmouth 
on, oh, a, on, on, on my stand up paddleboard, okay, <laughs> which I love to diss, but That's incredible. Um, it was quite fun, uh, especially going down the rapids, uh, Simmons Yacht, okay, um, yeah, it's a good yep. climbing there as well, yeah. Um, but in full view of all the, the kind of kayak school looking at me, I could just feel their, their watchful eyes willing me to fall off. Um, <laughs> but I, I wasn't, I was going to leave them disappointed, but nearly they, they had the slalom poles strung out across the river. Okay. And I nearly got taken out by one of those, but um, I had to disappoint them and oh, uh, yeah, stayed you on. Stayed, two feet. You stayed on, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's definitely uh, one of my favorite. And my other favorite places, of course, um, the area to the east of, of Salzburg, which is the um, uh, the the Lake District of Austria. And I've I've okay. I've been going back back to there for about ten years. I, I took a job there. I was working for a, a sports agency called um, Zoom Productions. Okay. Um, and it's actually the headquarters, global headquarters of Red Bull, are based are based there in, in a place called Fuschel am uh, right. which is about 20k east of Salzburg. And you know, you've got lakes, you've got mountains. What more do you want? You've got you know, yeah. climbing in the summer, you've got skiing in the winter. Uh, it doesn't get better. Um, and the climbing there, the limestone is is very similar in character to to the limestone that I that I grew up um, climbing on. And you know, it's the sort of place as one you know you could do nice easy kind of cragging or a bit more adventurous stuff yeah. um lots of big routes there big walls you got the Watzmann um and such just to the south of Salzburg in in Berchtesgaden which is another famous um mountain um you know where all the all the legends climbed you know um Hermann Bull for example he, yes he climbed it solo in winter um and um you know Heckmeyer the guys who were on the Eiger for sure I can't yeah. remember exactly but I'm sure they they would have been up there as well um, in the yeah, 30s, yeah. Um, in that sort of Munich, uh, Munich era. As part of the Red Bull TV, you did a little video diary type thing, a thing called Insiders. Oh, yes. Um, can you tell me a bit about that, about what you did? <laughs> it looks it looks quite fun. As I can hear from that, it sounds quite fun. <laughs> it was, yeah, it, it was. Uh, yeah, that was a special, uh, uh, a special period um, where um we decided that the, the, the best way to it was it was at a time when red bull and gopro kind of did this partnership okay. so we decided and we were looking after the um editorial channel the red bull.com adventure channel yeah and, and we were pumping out it was like a, just a generic online magazine um online uh, um okay. uh, you know adventure stories and i was i was one of the editors and um with the channel manager we decided hey look why don't we just go and do some of these events and um and film it from the inside and, and just here, take a few GoPros. And, and um, so I did, I did lots of different, slightly quirky events. I, end, I did the World Bog Snorkeling Championships in mid Wales. Um, I, did, I, did, I went to uh, Mumbai, India and took part in a human pyramid building uh, oh, contest. I think I might have seen that, but not, not was, with you in it, but I've seen that before. Yeah, it looks which incredible. Was, crazy sort of you know climbing up off the backs of these uh, local chaps uh, and uh, <laughs> hoping it doesn't yeah. all come crashing Probably down, crashing down yeah. I think it was a little bit heavier than they're used to uh, that was a good one I'm trying to remember some of the other ones I did um, oh I did the rebel Neptune steps which is the the, the swim in um, in Glasgow uh, in January and okay. I think the, the water was about seven degrees it was really oh, very very grief. very cold and um you're swimming up the locks basically like a salmon um yeah. you get to the kind of the lock and then you have to climb up the water and they, they throw down these cargo nets um and you've got to sort of scramble over there um yeah that's a lot of fun and, and dodge obviously the uh you know the shopping trolleys and dead bodies so that was so fun. so yeah it sounds like you you just live in the outdoors and don't do anything else um well of course that's the impression i like to give i've, I've i'm very lucky i've had some amazing experiences as, as a journalist and and, yeah. and with the, with the tv as well of course you know we all know it's, it's not always like that most it's of not. my time is you know still glued behind a, a a computer screen and and you know i mix it up with other jobs as well um yeah. as i mentioned the you know work for the sports agency in austria and uh you know that was a full-time thing um quite uh you know, uh, hard, long driving, driving a desk, as they say in the yeah, military. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So have you got any um, other projects that you're working on or any ideas that you can talk about? So um, obviously I'm gearing up for the um, Ice Climbing World Cup, um, okay. which kicks off in uh, November, December time. 
Yeah. Um, so uh, that will be really, really exciting. So can and... you can you get out to? There's a place in the states. I think it's Ure, Is it the Bice Park there? Yeah, actually, you... um, the, 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 that that will be um, the Ure Ice Festival. Is 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 amazing. Um, yeah, uh, really cool. But it looks like we're not going to go there. Um, oh. It's not a. It's, it's a sort of um, a, a kind of partner event, but it's not one of our. It's not an official world cut world uh, tour stop. Okay. Which means, that unfortunately, okay. I, I won't get the chance to to go there for for work yeah. uh, reasons. But there, there looks like there's going to be um, a tour stop in the US. Um, so so that that's quite exciting. Good. Have um, you done ice climbing before or not? Um, I, I sort of climbed. I, I climbed. I took up ice climbing when I first took up climbing twenty odd years ago. Then sort of didn't do much you know, in the, in the last in a sort of 10 years and then sort of got back into it a bit over the last um, few years. Um, yeah. It is it is a great sport, actually. It's not, there's nothing quite as satisfying as getting to the top of, you know, an ice climbing pitch. And it's, you know, yeah. I like, you know, the physical aspect of it is very physical um, and, um, you know, slinging an ice tool and just hearing that lovely sound as it yeah. kind, of, uh, 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 kind of tucks into the ice. Of course, sometimes you don't always hear that lovely sound and, you know, it can be uniquely terrifying as well um, when your kind of ice is shattering or, or quite often what happens, especially if you're not climbing very often, yeah. is, you know, your weaker arm. So my, my left arm is just, you know, hopeless after, <laughs> uh, you know, after a pitch at the top of a pitch and it's just flailing around and you just can't, you're trying to trying to just do an accurate um uh, you know, pitch, uh, the, the, you know, an, an accurate kind of throw of the arm into the ice. Yeah, yeah, um, pick, and, yeah. And, and it's just flailing all over the place and, and it's not <laughs> getting any purchase. And, and yeah, and then your leg starts wobbling and you get cramp and your glasses have steamed up and, you know, and yeah. you get hot aches and, you know, yeah. <laughs> no, but actually, you know, honestly, it, it's, um, the technique it, it's not it's it's not ridiculous you just you just need to train and, and have a degree of you know flexibility get that technique dialed yeah, yeah and also it's a thing where you benefit from being relaxed if you're tense if you try and murder the ice you know you're <laughs> going to be exhausted after 10 meters yeah. it's learning to be able to trust to step up after just um, placing your tool once you know a lot what a lot of beginners do well they'll just sort of smash it in about three or four times you know each one trying yeah. to go in for the kill you know even harder <laughs> take it out kill and, and it's you know you should you know learn especially and if it's on a popular route you don't need to swing your tool at, uh, at all um, you can just literally place it you can hook it in a pre-existing hold and, and normally it's good enough step and up be fine yeah and yeah. um yeah and um and the great joy of ice climbing is is on the main you know you can you can put your feet um anywhere you know with rock climbing you are there's certain moves you have to do and if you can't do it yeah. you're a little bit stuck whereas ice climbing <laughs> generally certainly at the kind of entry level of the sport you can just pick your own line we, we talked about um you know books, books. um I enjoyed Ed Caesar's book because I, I kind yeah. of take my hat off to the research and I've, I've been trying to do a little bit of research myself on this, this period in the, in the kind of the 1930s. And it's difficult, you know, to, to try and track down people still alive or who may have letters and this kind of thing. Yeah. And as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of fascinated by the, the period between the sort of thirties and the fifties. And also, you know, in, on a previous podcast, you talked about, I think the, um, the Leonel Terry and, um, you know, conquistadors of the useless and yeah. also, yeah. um, Gaston Rebelfast, Starlight oh, and, yes. and, and Storm, which are, you know, those two books should, should <laughs> be on any, um, aspirant climbers kind of, but that, that whole kind of era and, um, um, you know, it, I mentioned also Andel kind of Heckmare and, um, yeah. And what happened to these guys during the Second World War? And um, I think that's quite quite interesting. And, and, you know, there's some stories, there's some published accounts, but I'm not sure how trustworthy they are. Okay. But there's, yeah. there, there's one account that has Heckmare on one side of Mont Blanc uh, okay. engaged in a, in a mountain battle. I mean, Mont Blanc, there was a, a, a battle on Mont Blanc, uh, uh, which was the highest in the Second World War, right at the end of the war as well. And you just think how pointless this, this kind of was. Yeah. Um, you know what are you expecting to gain and there was a whole kind of siege where the you know the the the, the french um uh uh maquis kind of went up and and basically with kind of artillery and spotter planes and it eventually dislodged the kind of the germans from the other side 
But, uh, you know, Rebufa and Terry both served in the um, resistance. And um, yes. you can, I find it rather fascinating that, that kind of Heckmare and, and Rebufa could have been on basically other sides of the mountain during this, this, <laughs> um, during this period. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, let's see. Is there anywhere that people can get hold of you or anything or have a look at your projects or anything like that? You can easily find me on social media, um, Adventure Tark. Um, so, um, yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, we could probably carry on talking for hours and hours about climbing books. But it's, yeah, uh, it's, definitely. it's, it's, yeah. it's a great topic. There are some there are some good ones out there. The, the one book I do want to read is, is, is Leo Holdings um, latest book. Well, his only book, I think. Yeah, he's an amazing climber, and uh, I think some of the things that he's done have been incredible. So I'm sure that would be I've, an I've, entertaining read. Yeah, I've seen his um, film where he goes on top of a tapui. I'm trying to think where it is. Rarema, I think it is. His he did a film about that, and that was that was incredible. And he was, you know, charging through the jungle and getting to the base of this this tapui. Um, yeah. I think uh, yeah, it, and 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 it's just his expeditions and his climbs. You know, they've got. You know, they're, they're not only kind of bold, but they're really imaginative. Um, you know, the yeah. stuff that he's doing in, you know, in Antarctica or Baffin Island. Um, yeah. And then he sort of, you know, he kind of jumped, I think he jumped out of an airplane and, he, <laughs> uh, you know, you know, there's some style as it well. It sounds like something that, you, then, that you'd want to do. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't jump out of airplanes. No, thanks. You're okay with a wing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll yeah. launch from the hillside. Yeah, okay, that's fine um, for me. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great one, Stuart. Um, Keep up the good work. Thanks very much. Thank you. That's, that's very kind of you to say.